These people are using the suppression of the Western market against us. Look at the deliveries off the Shanghai Gold Exchange. They're off the charts. So they're bleeding dry, the LBMA and the COMEX, and the deliveries are off the charts. Hmm. See the bigger picture? If not, you're going to get rolled over by this when it all breaks. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for April 29th through May 6th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature 2023 one-ounce South African Silver Krugerrand at just $3.10 over spot. Next, backdated one-ounce gold Australian kangaroos are only $59 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this widely followed returning guest. Andy Schechtman is the CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. He joins us this Tuesday, April 30th, 2024. Andy, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Done again. It is always my pleasure, my man. Thanks for having me. We've got a roster full of things we need to talk about today. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up really briefly on our way in is uh, as people awaken, more and more of them, more than a half percent of the population perhaps uh, that have already in the past been cautious about being prepared by owning things of intrinsic value, reducing reducing counterparty risk where possible, et cetera. We have new questions from those who are just re recently waking up to the fact that they have counterparty risk on their bank savings, checking certificates of deposit its bank savings deposit boxes, uh, safe deposit boxes, uh, funds that are in money market accounts at their brokerage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People who've started to, have at least heard the the title of the book, The Great Taking, etc. As people of this next wave of the population awaken to the fact that we're all gravely exposed to unacceptable counterparty risk, they're starting to ask astute questions about the counterparty risk that still exists for people who own precious metals, such as future taxation, risk of government uh, confiscation, uh, nationalization of retirement accounts, all kinds of different questions of uh, stability of their or privacy, of their holdings are in vaults, et cetera, stability or safety of their, of their holdings if they have them in vaults, if there was social unrest and that sort of thing. So I think that's a good sign because I'd much rather have people asking tough questions than people just sleepwalking. Uh, so that's, that's a, but in any area of preparedness, one of the things that I have to walk through, uh, I guess, carefully and respectfully with people is that we don't live in a perfect world. We always can try to do uh, reasonable and prudent things to reduce counterparty risk, to position ourselves in uh, better sa areas of safety or preparedness, but we can't eliminate all risk or guarantee against all potential scenarios because you can always, as soon as you make up a grand plan, you can come up with a scenario that defeats that plan. So any thoughts that you have on that before we move into uh, some of the actual <laughs> clear and present dangers that are coming our way right now? Well, you know, the what if questions are impossible to answer. I mean, you have to suspend your imagination and and try to think what could possibly happen. Um, you know, when you talk about nationalization of IRAs, yes, that could happen. We've talked about that on this show before, a bill that made it down to the House floor in 2009 that that proposed just that, that if, you know, all hell breaks loose that they would, at the time, there was only, a, 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 it shows how fast the debt has grown, doubled since then, because I remember, if memory serves me right, it was 17 trillion dollar debt almost dollar for dollar with 17 trillion in in u.s ira funds and the idea was to if things got bad to sequester those funds put them in what amounted to an ira backed by the government backed by u.s treasuries a 17 trillion dollar injection into the treasury market would in their mind stabilize things it would be a guaranteed annuity but that means whatever you were invested in that ira well too bad for that. I don't think they really thought the whole thing out well, because as you would sell one asset to buy another, there would be reverberations all over the place. But it, needless to say, was voted down. It, it didn't make it past just being a bill. And um, But the genie was let out of the bottle. It is something they understand. When we talk about storage facilities, this is why I work with Brinks in our own private storage program, because they have the balance sheet. They are a behemoth they 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 to me in, a, in an imperfect world are as good as it gets i mean as as you were saying you can always find a problem and this is the ultimate you know really the description of why gold and silver are 
so important, at least in this respect, in a world of counterparty risk, to have an asset that is no one else's liability and holding it in your own possession. But there are times you can't do that. So we try and think that through and find the best option we believe we have. Even in an IRA, if the custodian goes upside down, but the metals are held at a depository, not in cash in their bank account at the custodian, you know, I think you're you're better off than most in the ability to go and take possession of it if you need to or have it shipped is always an option. So in a world of imperfect choices, I think these, you know, at least address some of the concerns. But you're right, there there is no magic bullet. But being awake, being alert. And trying to be a step or two ahead of the masses anyway, you know, that's about the best you can do along with preparing the best you can for what could potentially be the worst. I want to zoom in on one thing that you just mentioned, and that was about the interest that people have in IRAs at all. Like, why do we even care? Why would anyone even want to do an IRA? And the biggest thing that most people think of in that area is tax deferment uh, to avoid current income taxes. And yet more and more of the clients that I speak with are convinced that as our uh, belated dear friend Rob Kirby used to say that cornered animals are dangerous. And if you look at uh, the U.S. being in a debt trap as most other Western uh, governments are with their fiat currencies and their spiraling national debts and everything, um, that they're more concerned that the governments might increase taxes in the future than decrease them. So what's the great benefit of postponing the inevitable if the inevitable is going to be worse in the future? And you were just bringing up to me before we started recording today some uh, current news right now this, this week happening about proposed increases dramatically that could completely change the landscape of the chessboard that we people are facing in terms of taxation and timing of that. Do you want to break those stories for us here? Yeah, you know, and and it's probably not for most of the people listening to this podcast. Some of them may be. Certainly some of the people you have on your show would have problems to worry about this. You'll see what I mean. You know, from the you can't make it up category, uh, as uh, as part of President Biden's, if he wins, uh, his budget proposal for 20, 2025 fiscal year, they're trying to raise an additional $4.3 trillion over 10 years. And I'll stop right there and say maybe if they just stop giving money to every other country around the world, we could probably save more than that in 10 years. And giving away $200 billion to the Ukraine, as an example, is probably not a great idea But from a broken, insolvent country. But I digress. Anyways, he wants to raise... $4.3 trillion over 10 years by raising the capital gains tax and by imposing, and by the way, he wants to raise the capital gains tax to over 44%, I believe, 44 and a half, I think is the number. And the reason I said it's not for everyone here, listen to this. Um, he wants to raise the unreal, uh, he wants to in, uh, apply an unrealized capital gains tax for people with wealth over $100 million. And now, I mean, from the too stupid to be stupid category, these are the people that are the wealth creators. These are the people that have lots of money in unrealized gains in things like NVIDIA and in Bitcoin. And if all of a sudden he thinks that he's going to impose what is to me about as uncapitalistic and un-American as it can be a a unrealized gain tax of 25% on the wealthy people. You see, I left Minnesota and I voted with my feet. It was a hard decision. I'm not a cent a millionaire, but, uh, you know, I, I, I picked up camp and I left. It cost me money, but I haven't looked back. But the guys with that kind of money, they'll just leave the country and they'll pull with it all of their businesses. They'll, they'll sell all their securities. They'll just be gone and, and leaving a vacuum of tax receipts now that they have to fill from someone else. This this Robin Hood style take from the rich and redistribute to the poor. Well, that goes right in hand with what we talked about last week in the uh, uh, in what's it called? The uh, Cloward Piven theory, where, you know, you read the redistribution of wealth. That's exactly what this is from a country whereby if you spent one hundred dollars every second of every day, it would only take one thousand nine hundred and sixty six years to equal the six point two trillion dollars that this this administration foolishly spent over the last 12 months. So instead of reining in their spending, which would really be the smart thing to do. They want to tax the people who have all the wealth. And those people largely are the ones that help the economy go and largely are the ones that invest and, and own businesses. And they'll be the ones to pick up tent and move to their yacht in the middle of some tax haven uh, country, you know, 
in the Caribbean. All I'm saying is it's it's just it's it's a, a continuation of stupidity that that really bothers me. And and uh, I don't know your feelings on it, but um, that's not the way to solve this problem. The problem starts starts the solving of the problem starts with reining in the ridiculous fiscal policy that we have where it's almost like a heroin addict who can't say no and can't stop spending and worse yet borrowing money at increasing interest rates to lend it out across the globe it it, you just can't make it up the only thing i would add to that is that every time we have seen this type of legislation not just in the financial realm but anywhere uh you know uh where you have you set a limit on on something that seems, oh, that makes it acceptable. And then that just gets ratcheted down. Or it doesn't get ratcheted down, but inflation takes takes you right into it. Alternative minimum tax is a good example. It was touted in the 1970s. Oh, we're gonna get those tax cheats, those fat cats, those rich so-and-sos that aren't paying their fair share. We're gonna make an alternative minimum tax. If you if you make over a certain amount, you have just have to pay and there's no, you lose all these deductions. And then cowardly and silently with the lovely effects of, of inflation, more and more and more percent of the uh, population have now been pushed up into that. It was supposed to be less than a half a percent of the population. Now it's getting to be within a few years, it's going to be more than half of taxpayers subject to alternative minimum tax. So it becomes what's good enough for the fat cats, but not good enough for us becomes pretty soon for all of us. So you you make an awesome point there. I mean, look, 400,000 a year or thereabouts, I think is the number. That's a lot of money, right? It is, but it's not what it was when you and I were young and kids, 400,000 would have been enough, you know, people would dream of that. And, and it still is a lot of money. But to say if you're making over 400,000 a year that you don't get any of the exemptions, you don't get any of the anything and you're taxed at at these super high levels. Um, it, that's, I kind of think what you're what you're referring to 400,000, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago was a ton of money. It still is a lot. But you know, it doesn't go anywhere near as far as it used to. And they're right. You're right. Inflation gets you up closer and closer and closer, builds up the number of people that I'm not saying that all these people have 100 million in wealth because of inflation, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him go the other way. Well, we're going to drop it down to if you have 30 million in wealth, that's still more than everyone owns. And they'll just keep finding ways to increase taxation. This is reminiscent of what a long time ago we were saying that it's inevitable that stagflation is coming. Higher taxes, lower productivity, and, and inflation. I mean, that's that's it. That's where we're heading. Now, uh, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen for this to get passed, including him winning the election. But the point of it is, is that that's the the thought process of these people. And it's just, you can't, you can't make it up. Well, the other thing that, that happens, as you mentioned, is those who can afford to escape and be, the money will flee to where it is treated better. That's, I mean, we've had... Um, Lobo Tigre, who we interview per- periodically on our on our channel, he, he is now a resident of Puerto Rico because there's no federal income tax in Puerto Rico and there's no capital gains tax of certain types and businesses can operate tax free if you structure them correctly and that sort of thing. So there's there's lots of examples going on of where money goes to where it's being treated well. And so you and we we moved here from the Toledo, Ohio area, which ha- it was one of those one of those troubled metropolitans that that tries to solve their budget deficits and their unpayable obligations to their to their various uh workers that over the past 40 years amassed you know great union contracts and that sort of thing with by increasing the taxation on their dwindling base you've got suburban flight out of the area increased crime in the area and increased taxes and new york's been suffering from the same thing and so on and so on so california as well so it becomes a a debt trap, a death spiral for places that follow that trajectory. It's not a good sign for, it's not It's not a healthy, productive economy. It's not a way to grow a productive future. Well, look at St. Louis, the 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 former one AT&T center that was sold for $205 million in 2006. I mean, someone wants a, a very big home, you can go buy it. It just sold for $3.6 million just recently. So in 2006, it was sold to a REIT for for two two hundred and five million dollars, and now it's just sold for one and a half percent of that for three point six million. You can't make it up. What do you think St. Louis is like right now, or the Holiday Inn Express in Washington D.C.? The only person bidding for it was the 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 lender. That's it. It was in foreclosure, and it, they paid eighteen point five million for it, um, and the lender was owed eighty three million on it. And, he, you know, I mean, you talk about an 80 percent write down. So this is going on all throughout the big cities and it's not stopping. And so expect as the commercial real estate problem grows, expect 
more of this where taxes are going to go higher because the people that own these businesses that are leaving that that you know that are being targeted they're going to go they're going to leave these crime ridden big cities um, and it will only get worse and this is again go back to the cloud piven theory what do you got big cities that are overrun that become massive entitlement centers i mean you can't make it up you really can't anyways enough about that it gets me upset well the the point i, I want to make again turn this to actionable uh, intel for the people who watch this channel is if you're if you're counting as part of your strategy on a idea that taxes are going to be lower in your retirement years than they are now and so deferring taxes is a good idea you might want to rethink that given the changing regimes given the desperation and the debt trap that us and other many municipalities many states many uh, cities are in you might want to revisit that and think hmm what if taxes get a lot higher in the future and what if the assets that you have invested in go higher along with it? That's a really super solid point. I like what you said there. Next thing, uh, you've been talking about weaponization of the dollar and confiscation of Russian assets, et cetera. Can we talk a bit about that and what's going on in that category? Yeah, I mean, it, again, from the too stupid to be stupid category, the summary or the Repo Act 4175, um, basically to seize the Russian uh, assets. And uh, of their forex reserves, five billion of them are, are here in the United States for sure, and well, they want to seize those assets and give them to the Ukraine. Um, I mean, you can't make it up, and this is probably why you just saw a Russian court that ordered seizure of four hundred and forty million dollars uh, held by uh, in J.P. Morgan assets, um, and it's tit for tat. But you can't make it up. I mean. We go around telling China, you're not allowed to give any money to Russia, your ally in the BRICS. If you do, we will sanction your banks, your companies, and even Beijing. But we can not only give the Ukraine 200 million with no congressional oversight, we can actually seize the assets, the Russian Forex reserves, uh, and they're, you know, they're begging their allies in the G7 to do the same thing. They have to have kind of a unanimous decision to allow this, including the funds in 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 uh, the European Union, but they want to take all this money and give it to the Ukraine to, you know, I mean, so we can take the at your assets because we don't align with you, even though most of the countries think we're hypocritical and then give it to the country you're fighting on top of already giving them, you know, 200 billion in aid and providing logistics and support and, and weapons. And it's just, you have to wonder what's going on. Don, again, I don't understand how this could even be thought uh, acceptable. And I don't care how you feel about Russia. I mean, when you cross the line as the reserve currency, it was bad enough to sanction and weaponize. It's a whole nother thing to confiscate and then give the assets to a foe that you're in the middle of a war with. I mean, they'll write about this in history books as the epitome of stupidity, or maybe they will. it will be discovered this was what they were doing to try and elicit a, re a, a reset. I don't know which one it is, but I mean, you have to ask yourself, OK, is there a middle ground here? Either it's ridiculously stupid or they're trying to do something. And to see the continuation of sanctions, I mean, and people, you know, look, if this administration wins current, I, I fear for this country. But look, I, I, I think Biden uh, or, or I think Trump should be the president. I think he'll be a whole hell of a lot better. But even he's dumb in talking about sanctioning other countries if they stop using the dollar, like the BRICS. You can't sanction. You have to stop. The country has to stop going around being coercive and being the big bully that everyone is rallying against. This is the rallying cry. And whether it be, I mean, God help us if the current administration wins, we're, we're in big trouble. And, and if Trump wins, great. I think we have a better chance of slowing things down. But even him saying publicly, we will sanction countries that try and move away from the dollar. No, you can't do that. You can't make someone take your currency or bully them into it. And that's, you know, I wonder what's going on in this, in, in this country when you see nothing in regards of, to cooperative relationships, mutually beneficial. Rather, it's, it's, it's just the stick. There is no carrot. It's just the stick. And well, the carrot would be we'll give you money, but we have to borrow that money or print it. So, I mean, you can't make it up. Yeah. In fact, in order to lend it to you, we've got to borrow it from you. Would you please buy our treasury debt? <laughs> and if you think if you realize that all military spending is discretional, 
by 2031, the, the, the Congressional Budget Office says all discretionary spending will need to be borrowed, all of it, because all of the, in, the income derived from, from tax receipts will go just to pay mandatory entitlement spending like Medicare Part B, which is 90 plus trillion in the hole, Part D, 20 plus trillion in the hole, and Social Security, 77 on top of the debt. And so that doesn't take into account the people that have come in this country illegally. Who's going to pay for them? Look what's happening in, in Colorado. Every single uh, uh, government office in Denver has to slash everyone to give find money to give to these people who are here illegally. And, and I, you know, again, this country is great because we all come from somewhere else. But, you know, the majority of the people here and their heirs uh, or, or their, excuse me, their their ancestors or their family before them, rather, they all came the right way and they did it the right way legally. And so I'm not I'm not saying that immigration is bad. In fact, that's what makes this country great. But doing it the right way and and yet we're we're bankrupting ourselves across the globe and giving money we shouldn't give and borrowing it to do so or allowing this to happen, this mass migration of people into our big cities that are bankrupting the cities and making businesses fail. Uh, commercial real estate topple, the banks that hold the debt, they're on razor's edge and all the big money who runs it all, they're going to say, I'm out. Goodbye. And, and I mean, it's you put it together, you see it starting to spin and spin and spin. So anyways, let's keep going. The, uh, the other thing we have talked about several times and broken open at some level of detail on our channel here is the great taking. First, we talked about a separate topic, which is nothing in the bank belongs to you. The second is perhaps nothing in the brokerage account belongs to you. You put those together, that covers pretty much all of the uh, retirement plans for most of the baby boomer generation. And there's been a new development in the area of the great taking, a BIS warning that just came out this week. Yeah, you know, for those people who are not, I mean, in a very broad sense, the the regulators want basically everything, including a wide ranging uh, uh, slew of derivatives, even the twenty six trillion dollar U.S. Treasury market, all of the securities, I mean, stocks, they all are supposed to go through a clearinghouse uh, or clearing houses um, in order to, I guess, ensure swifter com uh, uh, completion of the trades, whatever. Um, but now the BIS just came out and said that they're warning that central clearinghouses that hold over one trillion in liquid assets may exacerbate periods of financial stress. Regulators must equip themselves with tools such as bail-in bonds, hmm, interesting, to deal quickly with a failed clearinghouse for stocks, bonds, or derivatives without having to call on taxpayers for cash. Um, and, you know, the last part of the article says temporary public funding, temporary, just like they close the gold window temporarily, temporary public funding for liquidity should be relied on only as a last resort, said the Financial Stability Board. So, you know, do you hear the cracks? Do you hear, do you see the smoke? I mean, you know, David Rogers Webb, it was fantastic, but it's like people forgot about it already. Well, the BIS just should have just warned us. The only problem is, you got to come on a show like yours to hear this. It, why is this not front and center on 60 Minutes or on the evening news or on Fox, who supposedly tells us more fair and balanced? You see, as I said before, the, the, the media doesn't do a poor job. They do no job of letting people get out of the way of what is coming. And, you know, God bless you and your family for doing what you do. I say it again and again. It, it, it's important because the media is not telling us what's really going on. Some things they can't not tell us, and that is when you actually have the final banks failing, uh, uh, failures of banks. There's a, we, just this last week, we had a failure of yet another bank, Republic First Bank, closed by Pennsylvania regulators. And there's an article, uh, report posted on the Social Science Research Network found that 186 banks in the United States are at risk of failure or collapse due to rising interest rates and high proportion of uninsured deposits. Uh, your uh, your research on this topic right now for people who are trying to decide if this is the time to get their nest egg out of the banks. Well, I mean, look, what's happening right now with gold and the bonds? Why would any country, like, look at China. They used to have almost $3 trillion in treasuries. They're down to just over $700 billion. Why would any country want to hold any of our debt of any duration when this stuff is happening? When we go around the world imposing sanctions on everyone and now confiscating those assets. And, you know, 
it, it's okay for us to do it, but you can't. So, but hey, take our debt, please. We we need to to build our military because we've borrowed um, all this money to other countries that we really don't have. But why would anyone want to hold our debt of any duration whatsoever? And the answer is they won't, because we've chosen inflation over austerity. We know that if we raise rates, we blow everything up. If we lower rates and inject inflation and signal that we will never balance uh, or, or normalize our balance sheet and let the inflation engine engine run, well, it leads to the same place of higher interest rates. And so the Fed's trapped and they know it. Why would anyone hold these long-term duration bonds? And so, you know, when you talk about um, the banks, right, um, ultimately, I've said for a very, very, very long time that interest rates spike to the moon as as people dump our treasures. Well, it's happening. The little by little by little, it's happening. You can see it. Now, we're supposed to believe that the United Kingdom and Ireland and the Cayman Islands are, are you know, next to the Federal Reserve will be the biggest holders of our debt. The UK is going to pass uh, China here very quickly. And Jim Willie, I love the guy. He's got courage to say things I don't. He says that Ireland and UK and Cayman are being funneled money by the Fed under the table to do this. Because why the hell would they want our treasuries too? They're, they're not dumb. They see what's happening. And to keep the game going a little bit longer, we have a situation where the countries that were always buying our treasuries are now selling them and replacing it with oil and gold because these are assets that have no counterparty risk and are demanded across the majority of the globe. It's a new system where gold and oil are being remonetized, in my mind, in favor of the U.S. Treasury. You're seeing de-dollarization and de-treasurization. So when you talk about a bank that failed, well, yeah, look at all the 185 banks that you mentioned on Razor's Edge. What will break it? Rates rising. Well, you know, Powell said that that um, his mentor uh, was, uh, what's his name? Um, the, the former uh, Paul Volcker. Volcker was his mentor for raising rates to 18 and three quarters percent, right? Well, he ain't no Paul Volcker because he realized that he got, you know, you get to 5% on the 10 year treasury, you, you're going to have things start to break. And he's not doing that. So, how about the villain theory that I've talked about endlessly? Make people say, what the hell is going on in the United States? And look what they're doing around the world and they're broke. We don't want it anymore. And besides, they're going green. We, they don't want to be part of the oil gang. And so besides, all those guys are now joining the BRICS. It's time to, to go move another way. And all these countries dump dollars. Or they just say we're not taking dollars for oil anymore. I mean, you can see it. And, and maybe this is why you're seeing the yen so low, to keep that carry trade going, to keep the dollar strong. I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on anymore other than to say ultimately I see rates going much higher much higher, because there is no way they can ever normalize the balance sheet. Either the whole thing blows up or they choose inflation. It's one or the other, and there is no other way they can do it. And rates will go higher. What does that mean for the banks? What does that mean for the insurance companies? So yeah, when you talk about the great taking, the risk, and, 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 and how undercapitalized and over leveraged this whole system is, including the FDIC, which during this banking funding costs the FDIC 667 million that they only have one point what 1.8 billion in their account or less than that backing 18 trillion so i mean how, how many more banks this is a small one how many more can fail before boom i don't know you have any thoughts on that well besides you led us you read to us last week from some verbiage in the uh, dodd frank act of 2010 that talks about how and and part of this orderly uh, takeover process and, and uh, orderly paying out of different cl asset classes, owner holders, that it can take three to five years, even for insured depositors to get their FDIC insurance, if they get any at all in this undercapitalized insurance, uh, basically Ponzi scheme. Uh, what about uh, those who are making moves to get their hands on physical? You've been watching the exchange for physical on the major exchanges. What's going on there? Yeah, I really, I want, I think this is a really cool point. And I don't think really anyone's talking about it. Um, some people are maybe, but I don't see many people. So the other day, right, we saw 7,560 gold kilo bars that were shipped out of the Comex, okay? That's $571 million worth of gold, 243,054 ounces. Who's got that kind of bread, right? So 
it was all shipped through to Hong Kong Brinks. The exchange for physical is a way where you can buy a contract on Comex and exchange it for physical, typically in London. But if it's done in the OTC market, the over-the-counter, the two participants can negotiate and say, I'll take it here. And they can even negotiate, I believe, in the form of the gold. You want gold eagles? Fine, we'll deliver it there. But anyways, the OTC is, in respect to Brinks in Hong Kong, almost all of the, and this is a COMEX-approved vault, right? It, almost all of these transactions that go to Hong Kong, Brinks, are OTC, right? Almost all of them, or excuse me, E exchange for physical, almost all of them, right? And so what happens is, is that you had 243 thousand ounces get delivered in the OTC market in exchange for physical to Brinks, Hong Kong. And what happens then is that once the gold arrives in Hong Kong, the trade is unwound in COMEX and the bars are then transported by armored truck to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So again, we've been saying this forever. These people are using the suppression of the Western market against us. They they short the price on uh, on COMEX. They they then take uh, purchase the physical at a subsidized price and stand for delivery in Hong Kong and then move it to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And look at the deliveries off the Shanghai Gold Exchange. They're off the charts. So they're bleeding dry. The LBMA and the COMEX having it moved to by exchange for physical to Hong Kong and then driven over by armored car to the Shanghai Gold Exchange where they take delivery. I mean, you can't make it up. And and between the Shanghai Gold Exchange, um, where those purchases are like cash and carry, and the Shanghai Futures Exchange, the combined average daily volume over the past two months has increased more than 200%. And it now exceeds the average trading volume of the New York COMEX market. Effectively, that now makes Shanghai the world's second largest gold trading market after the London Bullion Market Association. Little by little by little by little. Do you not see it, you guys? Over 200% in the past few months. Hmm, interesting. And it's all exchanged for physical. Interesting. And it just happens to end up at Brinks Hong Kong, which is a COMEX approved vault. And then it just happens to find its way to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and the deliveries are off the charts. Hmm. See the bigger picture? If not, you're going to get rolled over by this when it all breaks. I hope people do. And if you look, China's net gold imports via Hong Kong in March rose about 40% from the previous month. They continue, continue, continue to slowly increase, and the media does nothing to tell us what's happening. In addition to this exchange for physical, which is bleeding the COMEX off and it's ending up uh, going out the back door of the Shanghai exchange, you also have talking about metals fleeing the Fed. Can you clarify? Yeah, I know we're getting late for you, and I apologize for going so long here. I, I love being on here with you, Dunnigan. There's just so much to talk about. But, you know, when we, we go way back to the beginning, when you and I started talking several years ago, we talked about the bleeding dry of the New York Fed by the Eastern European banks, right? The, the German Bundesbank, Bank of Turkey, Hungary, Czech National Bank, Bank of Austria, Bank of Poland, they all said, give us back our gold. And, and they're the ones that went on the big buying spree, right? Well, now, because of the weaponization of assets and, and the weaponization of, of the dollar and, and the treasury market, you know, I think it was Representative Mooney who asked the Fed for who's taking all the gold, Where's it, who's repatriating all their gold. And even through the Freedom of Information Act, they didn't answer, at least to my knowledge. But I just read an article, and, and I'll, I'll read a little bit of it here, too. Several, several African and Middle Eastern nations have begun withdrawing their gold reserves from the United States in recent months. Nigeria, South Africa, well, that's interesting. Um, those are BRICS members. Well, Nigeria applied and an OPEC member. Ghana, Senegal, Cameroon, Algeria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. Hmm. Uh, each representing crucial regions in Africa and the Middle East um, to withdraw their gold reserves from the New York Fed. And, and so this is, this is about counterparty risk. Again, why would you trust? This is, a, this is trust, and we have squandered the trust. 
And, and that's why you're seeing countries sell treasuries. And that's why you're seeing all of these countries and all of them are going to apply to the BRICS or in the BRICS or on the Belt Road. Every one of them says we're the next target. So let's let's slowly get our stuff back. Let's slowly uh, extricate ourselves from uh, from the Treasury market. I mean, you can see this happening and it's all put all of these things together that we've talked about today in a bigger context and then look at it. And, it, and and this is where Occam's razor comes in. This is where, I, I, I mean, I I try to follow this linear path, but the more stuff I see, it, it just is shocking to me that how fast it's accelerating. And when you see Saudi Arabia and Egypt just happen to be new members to the BRICS, um, repatriate their gold from the Fed, and you can see the amount of, of treasuries they're selling and the amount of gold they're buying you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see those crumbs laid at your feet and where do they lead to? So this is another thing that I think is just um, part and parcel for the times that we are in. And I expect to see greater acceleration over the next few months as we lead to the big BRICS meeting in October. Remember, there were 200 meetings from the beginning of this year to that meeting. So it's every day there'll be something new. And then, of course, God willing, we get a chance to vote in the next election, which I'm hoping we do then uh, I would say that this is, as the Chinese curse says, may you live in interesting times, is going to be the most interesting times that I've ever lived through in my career. And and um, so I know we've talked about an awful lot. Uh, let me pull up the specials because I know you're about to ask me that. And uh, this week we have um, 2023 Silver Krugerrands in original mint boxes, uh, $3.10 over spot and one ounce gold kangaroos at $59 over spot for those looking to uh, add a little metal to their portfolio. With the pullback we saw today, not a bad idea. And if I'm not mistaken, those are some of the lowest premiums we've had in the last four years for sovereign minted silver or gold coins. Yeah, for sure. And But the eagle kind of broke free from that cage and continues to go a little higher I don't know if it's uh, if it's foreshadowing a precursor to higher premiums, but the U.S. Mint is at it again, and uh, the premiums on the Eagles are beginning to, to rise. They're roughly double what they were by entire career. So while they're about half as much as they were roughly at its peak over the last few years, they're still double what they were for the last 20 years. Take out the last three, uh, and you know most of my career anyway. Well, Andy, we're grateful for these rapid fire updates on very important topics. I'm putting links in the description of this video to most of the, the topics that you mentioned here so people can follow up and share those uh, topics with their friends in a more authoritative way than just saying, hey, I heard something on, on the Internet because everybody hears something on the Internet. But we here try to give you credible stories that, that are actionable as well. So appreciate always your uh, your visits here with us every week for the weekly market update and uh, folks if you don't want to miss a single episode with andy uh, people ask me from time to time how can i make sure i don't i don't miss these well the best way is to just go to libertyandfinance.com put in your email address click submit make sure you confirm on the confirming email that starts at libertyandfinance.com your email and uh, you'll get one email in your inbox per day we don't share your email address with anyone else we don't spam you you get one per day it'll be our latest interview and the weekly special so you'll know those as well andy always always thank you for joining us on liberty and finance you got it my man all the best to you done again look forward to seeing you next week take care this is kaiser johnson with liberty and finance and these are the miles franklin weekly specials for april 29th through may 6th 2024 while supplies last First, we feature 2023 one ounce South African Silver Krugerrand at just $3.10 over spot. Next, backdated one ounce gold Australian kangaroos are only $59 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1 888 81 Liberty. That's 1 888 815 4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.